Welcome, Welcome to, to Be, Be the, the Ram, Ram Global, Global Fellowship. Fellowship. I'm Pastor Coach Anthony McKissick Sr., and this is Lady Liana McKissick, and we're glad to have you. All right, all right, all right. You already know what part it is. You know what time it is. This is my favorite part of the service. Put me in the game, Coach. That's what this is, because I'm challenging you. It used to be me that had to put them in the game, but this Sunday is on you. You are challenged to put three people in the game. How do I put people in the game, coach? I'm glad you asked. How you put someone in the game is, if you know someone who's at home, on their couch, in the bed, in somebody else's bed, in the car, even if they're at work, and you know they need to hear a word from God, and you feel like that word has been implanted in me, and I can impart it in them, then you share this stream. You share this live service. Go to your Twitter. Go to your Instagram. Go to your Facebook. Share the YouTube link. Share this link. Tag a friend and say, hey, there's a word from God, and I chose you to hear it. The worst they can do is not click on it, but what if they do? What if their life has changed because you put them in the game? Think about it. Share this message. Be blessed and be the ram. This is our BTR, Total Body Affirmation. Our goal, our call, our faith, our belief is that if you repeat this daily and make it a reality in your life, that your life will be oh so much better. So let's try it. I'll say it first. You repeat after me. Just like that. God, you are the head of my life. With all my heart, I will fight the good fight. With my feet, I will walk by faith and not by sight. With my mouth, I will speak life and not death. God, I promise to give you what's right and not what's left. God, you will provide the wisdom, resources, and the discernment to allow me to be the ram when my opportunity comes. Amen, amen, and amen. I'm out. Good morning, saints. This is your boy, Kenneas George, with your church minute. It's been a long week. When we thought it was safe to go back to the church house, COVID-19 came back on the rise. Yep. So you people who got your favorite seats in the church, uh, you got to wait another week or so because the cushion is starting to go back to its normal shape. So you urge your board members to walk around the house with your white gloves, take them off because you still got to be at the house. But you know what? There's a blessing in disguise. God is always in the blessing business, and I'm so proud of him. He blessed some of us this week. If you're an educator, you're starting to see the handwriting on the wall that we're going to be virtual learning in August. Look at God. Parents, it's still on you again. Look at God. Look at God making people be more involved in the education system. Bless them. Bless them. Shout out to all the educators out there and the parents out there. Remain to be safe. And let's take care of each other. Hello, this is Lady Liana McKissick with your wellness tip for this week. This week's wellness tip is to be sure to stretch before and after any type of exercise. Even walking, jogging, running, or in my case, hiking. About a week and a half ago, a friend of mine suggested me and uh, four other ladies um, go for a hike. Now, this was my first time going on a hike. Um, and we hiked up the tallest uh, waterfall in Georgia, right along the hiking trail. And um, on the way up the hike, um, I got ill. Um, but I had to take, so I took a little break. But I was fine after that. So we got all the way to the top, which it was, the whole thing was about 2.1 miles. But you're thinking a mile up uh, pretty much a miniature mountain, but the tallest waterfall in Georgia. Going across it and hiking down through trees and dirt and everything else. But I noticed 
right after that, I had a pain in my chest. And so it turns out I had a pulled muscle. I, because I did not stretch before the hike, nor did I stretch after the hike. And so this pulled muscle pain lasted for probably about five days. So my wellness tip once again for this week is be sure to stretch before and after exercising, running, walking, or in my case, going for a hike. Have a good week. Good morning, good morning. We're excited to be with you today. We're so excited to worship with you in your home today. So would you join us in a little bit of worship?
to set the captives free. Who could stop the Lord? Oh. That's all we need. It means more to me than diamonds. God, I don't really need status. Your glory means more to me than fame. We need your glory. Yeah. God, we don't just need your glory. We want your glory. Nothing else matters to us in this life. As a matter of fact, we tell you. Everything, it's all in your hands, God. Just do what you want in me. <laughs> That's all we need. That's all we need is your glory. Oh, hallelujah. Everybody ought to believe that and just get that feeling with us. Your glory. Your glory means more than power. I don't really need to be famous, God. All I need is your glory. That's all we need, your glory. Yeah. Means more to me than it means more to me than status. Say that with me, choir. We want your glory, Lord. We want your glory, Lord. When you want the glory of God, here is what you pray to the Lord. My life, my, life, my plan, my plans, they're all in your hands. In your hands. God, I move out of the way. And I just tell you, you do what you want in me. Because at the end of the day, all I need is your glory. That's all we need, your glory. Hallelujah. Let your glory bring rain in this place. Let your will be done. 
I don't want to see anything before I see your face. Show us your face. In this place. We tell you like the Lord's Prayer, let your, let your kingdom come. come. Let your will be done. Yeah, God, we reach out to you and tell you tonight. Let your kingdom come. Not my will, but your will be done. Yeah, say it good tonight. Show us your face. Just reign your glory in this place. Let your kingdom come. God, please let your will be done. Yeah, we're better than Moses. He couldn't see it, but tonight we can. Show us your face, God. Reign in this place. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Right about now, you ought to be saying that with us. Show us your face. God reign. Yeah. Ah, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done.
now we've had singing, we've had dancing, we had comedy, we've had laughter, we've had crying. But it's time for the meat. It's time for the word. Bow your heads and close your eyes as we go to God in prayer. God, thank you for this opportunity that you've bestowed upon me to speak a word of encouragement to your people. A people that's hurting right now with COVID-19 and racial injustice, with things that we can't even speak of. I just ask you to decrease me and then increase yourself. I know that we're virtual, however, I'm just that much closer and you're just that much closer to where they really are. God, you said you would meet us where we are. And I thank you for all these streaming tools that allows us to be a vessel and to meet people where they are. So please remove all the distractions. Let the folks turn the TVs off, quiet their kids up. As a matter of fact, invite them in the room so they can hear a word too. God, I thank you for what's about to happen. In your mighty name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Now that we've prayed, I just want to introduce my message today. And it really stemmed from me being a basketball person at heart. And in the background of my spirit and my soul, I'm always thinking about basketball. And I was watching some old clips and Mark Jackson, who used to be a ball player, and then he is, you know, the coach of the Golden State Warriors. He's the one, I'd say, that kind of got their feet off the ground and got them, you know, where they are to get them where they needed to be. So I'm watching a Kobe Bryant highlight. And Kobe Bryant takes, he's playing against the Jazz, and he head fakes. And the defender goes in the air, and he goes under him. And he rolls up and he dunked the ball. And Mark Jackson said, Mama, there goes that man. Kobe Bryant ducks the ball. And in that moment, I, I, had a, I had an epiphany. I thought about, you don't say that to everybody. Although we're talking about the National Basketball Association, these are professionals. There's still different levels to this thing, as we like to say. There's levels to it. Just because you're a pro don't mean that you're that man. So then I, you know me, I'm, I'm quirky. So I, I looked up, what does it mean when you say the term, mama, there goes that man? And in the Urban Dictionary, it said that it is a symbolism of excellence. Whether it was a play or a player, that did something to a level of excellence. So when you say, mama, there goes that man, you're talking about a man of excellence. Are you catching on now, huh? Took you a while. You're like, where's he going with this? I, I didn't get on here for no basketball. Yeah, we all know a man of excellence. His name is Jesus Christ. So I thought about that. And I thought about just the intricacies of the play. When you think about a pump fake, it kind of gives you some insight on Christ and how he has us living our life when we're dodging the devil. You have the ball in your hands. A great coach, Grady Brewer, who's the head men's basketball coach at Morehouse uh, College, he said, basketball is a game of energy and the ball is energy itself. And if you have the ball in your hand, you have to have energy. You got to have synergy with your teammates. That's a whole nother sermon. But you got to have energy. So Kobe has the ball and you have the ball, which means you have an opportunity to do something with it. The ball could be a choice you have to make. The ball could be a marriage that you're in. A ball could be a job that you're in. A ball could be just Somebody, it could be your kids. However, you have it in your hand. And guess what happens when you get the ball in your hand? All the attention comes to you. See, it's easy to talk and it's easy to criticize from the bench. But when you're in the game and the pressure's on you, 
and the ball's in your hands and everybody's coming for you? Oh, that seat is real hot. It's very hot. Everybody can't handle the pressure of having the ball in their hand. However, the ball's in his hands and the devil comes, at, excuse me, his opponents come at him. And what he does is he shows one thing. He shows like, I'm going, I, I'm going to take my shot right now. So at that point, the devil, I mean, his, his opponents, they jump in the air because they're ready to take him out. They're ready to just slap that ball across into the stands and ha, 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 we're running off. But guess what? He had a trick up his sleeve. It was a pump fake. And he brought the ball down and took a step. He swiped through. So if you know basketball, your pump fake has to look just like your regular shot because people will study you. If you study film, you know your opponent's weakness. You know what they like for breakfast. You know if they sleep on their right side or their left side. However, you have to make it look the same. So God is saying that I made it look like you were about to do something else to the enemy just so they can have a smoke and mirrors type situation and they can attack something else. But right at the last moment, everybody realized that it was a pump fake because the ball never left your hands. You brought the ball down and you took a step. And while your enemies were over here, hating on you, while your enemies was over here talking about you on Facebook, while your enemies were over here on your job saying that you're going to be the one that gets laid off through this pandemic, while your enemies were doing everything that they were doing, you had already left the area. You had the ball in your hand and you swiped through and you took another dribble and then you went up. And before they know it, you caught a body and bang! Mama, there goes that man. Now you know you the man when you got everybody over here talking about you. That's symbolic. They're not talking about somebody that's not doing anything with their life. They're talking about you because you're the man. Let me give you another situation from the Bible. My text comes from John chapter 4 verses 28 through 29. I'll be reading from the King James Version but you can read along with me from whatever version that you have. Once again, I'll repeat. My text is John chapter four, verses 28 through 29. My pericope will cover verses two through 35. However, the verses that we'll focus in on right now is 28 and 29. And the word said, come, See a man which told me all things that I did that is not of Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Excuse me. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the man, Come, see a man, that man, which told me all the things that I ever did that is not. Is this not Christ, the Christ? Mama, there goes that man. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you five characteristics of that man. So when you meet that man, you know he's that man. Because sometimes you're gonna meet a whole lot of pretenders. You're gonna meet a whole lot of individuals who claim to be the man, but they're not really the man. And when we say the man, we're not talking about a genetic makeup. I'm not talking about a sexuality here. I'm talking about the man as in that person gets things done. Okay? So let's start back with the beginning of that chapter. When you go to verse, let me pull it up for you. Chapter 4, verses 4, starting on verse 4. And he must needs grow through Samaria. Then cometh to a city of Samaria called Sychar. What's happening, excuse me, what's happening here 
is that Jesus is going back to a place. That he, he left a place and now he's headed to another place. The place really doesn't matter in this message. <coughs> Excuse me, just know that he's leaving one place, he's going to another place, and he has to go through a city in Samaria called Sychar. We're on chapter uh, 4, uh, verses 4. Then come through the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Chapter, verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, and which means tired, with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which is noon. The first sign, mama, there goes that man, is mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by where he meets you. That man is not intimidated by where he meets you at. When you talk about meeting you, we can talk about a GPS location or we can talk about a spiritual location. Where did I get that? Samaria was a place that Jesus should not have been. And you remember the story about the Good Samaritan, which is an oxymoron because Samaritans were supposed to be bad. Now this woman is a Samaria. Sychar is a place in Samaria. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so let's just, let me make it plain and clear. And that's what I do. I'll, I'll read it from the King James Version and then I'll kind of give you how my, my thought process rolls in, my process. So the King James Version said, we must go through Sychar to get there, which he's saying like, man, for me to get where I'm trying to go, I got to go through sidecar. Do we have to go there? This is equivalent to you being in, uh, let's say you are, you are on the south side of Atlanta or you're on the north side and you have to get to the south side and you're saying, I got to go through Bankhead? Is there no other way? Your GPS has told you that you have to go through Bankhead. And you in a car, and your and your uh, your locks don't work, your windows won't roll up. It's, it's traffic is crowded, so you know you're gonna be a sitting duck. They're gonna know that you're not supposed to be there. But see, when Mama, there goes that man moment happens. They don't care where they meet you at. The man and the man. Let's be clear that we're talking about is Jesus. He doesn't care if you have to come to Bankhead, Buckhead. Uh, the North Side, uh, Brookhaven, Palmetto, Michigan, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, Tennessee, Kentucky, Baltimore. He does not care about your geographical location. He will come right where you are. Now let's, th let's talk about spiritual location. That man doesn't care where he has to meet you. He'll meet you at the bottom of an alcohol bottle. He'll meet you in the middle of a strip club while you're throwing money. You will be convicted by the spirit. He will meet you in the bed with someone else's husband or someone else's wife. That man, mama, there goes that man. He's not intimidated by where he meets you at. He don't care. That's why I get so uh, annoyed by all of us Christian folks who say, oh, you're gay, you can't go to church. If you're this, you can't go to church. If you're a gambler, you can't go to church. If you smoke weed, you can't go to church. God didn't care about you, where he met you at. I, I prefer to have those folks in the church because if you are delivered, if you feel that's what God is calling you to do, then you will be the one that can reach out and deliver others. I know nothing about gambling. I go to Vegas, I'm like a lost puppy. But if you're that person that's addicted, addicted to gambling, you can go in to that casino and you can talk to them because you know exactly what it feels like. That man is not intimidated by where he meets you. Let's read on. So I was at uh, nine, or uh, eight. So, so there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus is at the well here. Jesus says to her, 
give me, give to me a drink. For his disciples were going away to the city to get some food. Then the woman says of the Samaria woman, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask me a drink, a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew, <laughs> if you knew who it is that says to thee, give me to drink, then thou would have asked him to give you something to drink. He would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, <laughs> and the well is deep from whence hence thou living water. Art thou greater than the father Jacob, which gave us the well to drink thereof, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give them shall never thirst, but give him in, uh, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into the everlasting life. Point number two. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by how you see him. So the first one, he's not intimidated where he meets you. The second one, you know is that man because they're not intimidated by how you see them. So when I read it that way, I read what you read. But when I read it again, what I heard was, I saw a chick at a well, and Jesus was sitting at the well, and she comes walking up, and he said, hey, Charlie, get me some water. He probably didn't say it with an attitude like that, but that's how I was feeling when I read it. Hey, fetch me some water. And she looked at him like, some water? Do I look like a fetch me some water type of chick? Jesus is thinking the back of his head, you are a fetch me some water type of chick, but I'm not gonna call you out like that. But just so know, if it was me, if you really knew who I was, if you know, you know who, who was talking to you, you'd be asking me for some water. So she looked at him and said, boy, stop, you ain't even got a bucket, more or less uh, uh, some water. How you can't even get water out the well. How you, how you gonna look at me with your no bucket hat himself? You ain't got a bucket or a window to throw it out of. And you, you looking at me. But God responded. Jesus responded and said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me. The water in this well, you'll be thirsty again. But the water that I have, the well that I have within me, basically, your thirst will be quenched and you will never be thirsty again. So Jesus was not intimidated that this woman only saw him as a man with no bucket. See, when you're that man, you're not worried about what people look at you like. You're not worried about how they see you. You're not worried about how they perceive you. You're not worried about the fact that they put your business out there that you're going through a divorce and now, you know, everybody's talking about you. You're not worried about those things because you understand that you're not perfect anyway. You're not worried about the fact that, you know, you were on food stamps when you were in college. You're not worried about that you have to go to the free food donations just to eat. You're not worried about that you have to wash the shirt on your back right now in the sink and dry it on the, uh, on the tub, on the shower. You're not worried about the fact that they think you're broke because you won't sell drugs. They think you're broke because you're not walking around looking rich. You're not worrying about those things. See, a petty person, that's the kind of person that they're broke, but they, they steady buying clothes. They tearing them all down. You see them at the club and they head to toe, they just, they drip. They dripping so hard that you slip when you walking behind them. But they ain't got, ain't even got a bank account. 
they got to go to the check cashing place. And I ain't clowning the check cashing place. I'm just saying, if you the man, you don't live that type of lifestyle. You can put a rich person next to a broke person and you probably think the broke person has more money. Because a smart person told me, when you don't have something, you will try your best to make other people think that you do. So you're buying those clothes. You're buying those red bottom shoes just so people think that you have money. When you have money, in reality, you don't even want people to know you have money because you get tired of folks hitting you up asking for your money. Okay, y'all hear me? Y'all hear what I'm saying? So he's not even worrying about it. Now, once again, my twisted, whatever, different mindset, I'm seeing a chick basically, because we know her story, because we've read the Bible, she thinks Jesus is trying to holler at her. And he like, I don't want you. Girl, bye, bye, Felicia. Don't nobody want your little dusty butt. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to give you something that you don't have. You over here looking, looking me up and down. Oh, you ain't got no, you ain't got no. You know, y'all seen the meme. Yeah, you about to lose your job. You about to lose your, that's the kind of moment it was like, like she looked at him like, why are you even talking to me? And I hate to say it, there's a whole lot of pretty chicks out there that the dude, that the real Boaz in your life, the one that's trying to get at you, you done pushed him all over for some old old, old buster in a 98 uh, Lexus with some rims on it because he looked like he got money. Oh, that's his money. He ain't giving you nine. You don't let the good dude go by. And then you get mad when he marry a white woman. You call him a sellout. But he tried to holler at you for years while you turned him down, while you screenshot his DMs and sent it to the world. But, but let me get off my horse. Number one, mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by where he meets you. Mama, there goes that man, number two, that's not intimidated by how you see him. And number three, mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by your background. Yeah, you heard it right, your background. So the woman, you know, she's talking to Jesus. And after he gives her this pitch, and she says, basically, I might want to know something about this little water you got. If it was me, I'd sprinkle a little water on it and throw it a deuces and keep moving. Like, no, nah, that you better, you better lick the you better lick the, the little sprinkle sprinkle that I sprinkled on. You ain't getting none of my water. My offer's gone. But Jesus, he's a different kind of guy. He cares a little bit more than we do. He got a little bit more compassion than we do. However, so now she's saying, I, I want to know a little bit more about this water, this endless cup of water that's gonna fill me up that you got for me. And Jesus says, uh, in so many words, like. Yeah, I get it. I'll get it to you. I'll give it to you. But I want you to go and uh, go get your husband and come back. And, and she says, I don't have a husband. Now, if you're reading it the way I read it, it could have been two things. I know what she was thinking, but I know what Jesus was thinking at the same time. At least I think I know what Jesus is saying. What she's thinking is, oh, this man got a little bit of money. <laughs> Let me make sure my lash is right. Make sure my nails is popping. Make sure this and that. So when he asks, go get your husband. Oh, he trying to check. He trying to figure out if I'm single or not. I ain't got no husband over here, period, fool. And he like, nah, boo. I ain't even on that type of move right now. That's the word. Everybody that says hello to you is not trying to holler at you. That goes for guys and girls. Some people are just trying to be nice. That's free. Next time I'm gonna charge you. However, he says, go get your husband. She says, I ain't got no husband. His response, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the one you with right now is not your husband. In so many words, look, boo, we can end the little games. Let's stop playing games. I'm Jehovah. <laughs> like I'm him, I'm that guy, not mama. I'm that man. So you can stop playing with me right now. You ain't got no husband, you got five of them. And ain't none of them yours. 
You still out here getting water, boo. You you trying to flex? And, and, ain't that something? How people try to come for you and both of y'all at the bus stop? He, he, like, what can you add to my life? We both at the bus stop. We both at the well right now. And you trying to you trying to throw shade at me. We both in the projects. We both in the trailer park. Because you got a double wide and I got a single wide does not mean, hey, we still in the same tax bracket here. Okay? Let's let's make it clear. Let's make it plain so you can understand what's happening here. So basically Jesus was trying to say, look, but I know you. I, I know more about you than you know about yourself. So we can stop playing games. You you ain't no you ain't on no no white horse. I know what you done did last summer. I know what you did before you left here. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you hustling in reverse. If the men that you had, if the men you were with was treating you right, you wouldn't be out here. How you got five husbands and you with a husband right now and you still gotta come out here and get some water. Something just ain't right. And, that, and that's that's what where, where we're at right now. The, ser- the title of the sermon was going to be sinning, grinning, and still not winning. But it went in another direction. So you need to check your life and you need to ask yourself, am I sinning but getting nowhere? Am I cheating on my spouse to get a fulfillment that just cannot be filled? Am I lying and being manipulative to try to get ahead, but I can never seem to find myself ahead? What are you doing? Are you hitting licks and you ain't coming up? You out, you still selling weed? You 30 years old, 40 years old and selling nickel bags? Like you, the, what you have at stake versus what you stand to gain, it doesn't even like, it don't measure out. How you gonna get arrested for selling weed and lose your job when you 30? Something little teenagers be doing, trying to get shoe money and Walmart money. Like, come on. I ain't trying to tell you to be, you know, Noriega or a kingpin or, you know, join the cartel. But what I am trying to say, if you got five husbands, if you got, you, you sleeping with five dudes or you got five chicks, and you still can't get your hair done? You still can't get your nails done? You And you sitting here talking about, I'm in that pandemic. I don't need no man to do nothing for me. Well, you don't need him to, but you, whatever. So, that man is not intimidated by your background. And that is a literal statement. He's not intimidated by the fact that you're, uh, what you've been doing, the sin that you're living in, God will meet you right where you're at. And it's a spiritual statement. He's not intimidated by the fact that she was a Samaritan. He really wasn't even supposed to be talking this chick. But he wasn't intimidated by who she was. He wasn't intimidated that, that she was an addict. He wasn't intimidated by the fact that she had she, she was a stripper. He wasn't intimidated by the fact that she was a liar. He wasn't intimidated by the fact that he was a cheater. Oh, if you go down the list of sins, Jesus is not intimidated by any of your sins. He doesn't care about your background. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by where he meets you. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by where you, how you see him. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by your background. Mama, there goes that man that is not intimidated by the man you are with now. That's point number four. By the man you are with now. Where did you get that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me read it in case you think I'm not being uh, scripture based enough for you. So the woman says unto him, Sir, give me this water, for thou hast husbands. The woman said unto him, Sir, I, per- I perceive thou as a prophet. 
and uh, and they talked about being worshiping and where you should worship and where you should not worship. Jesus told her, like, look, there's going to be a time that you can either worship on the mountain or here. It's not going to matter. We're in that time right now. Uh, the woman said, and she went, basically what happened is that the woman, verse 25, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah comes with the call of Christ. He will tell us things. So Jesus said unto her, I speak unto thee. And upon this came the disciples and marveled, marveled that he talked to the woman. They were like, why is he talking to she's Jesus? Every time we leave, you're going to picking up these little dusty sideline chicks and you're talking to them and we don't want to be involved with that. And he like, dude, I found you. Uh, you was out there cussing and being a tax collector. So stay in your lane, take plenty of seats. That's how, that's, that's how that situation went. In the meantime, the disciples prayed for him, asking him if he wants to meet. He said he already got a meat. He got meat that's going to feed everybody. And the Samaritans believed the city. Samaritans in the city believed on him for the saying that the woman which testified that he told me that everything I did. So let me make it simple for you. The lady left and she went and told everybody that I just met a man. And that was our base scripture. It was 28 and 29, 11. The woman left her pot. She left her water pot. And she went her way into the city saying to men, come see a man that has told me everything that I need to know. This man that is not intimidated by the man you are with now. Just think about it. Jesus is not a Samaritan. And he comes to this Samaritan town and meets this Samaritan woman and tells her, I know about all your men, I know about your history. And then allows her to leave and go back to start telling people. Now the woman came to the well to get some water. So she had a bucket and she left her water pot and she did not like she left at this point jesus already knows that when she leaves and she go back to daddy house and she ain't got what he told her to go get he gonna be upset and he gonna want to know hey but hey hey i sent you to get some chicken and you come back you ain't got no chicken and you tell me about another dude like what, what what's really good I need to see this dude. So just imagine, you can cause a whole lot of problems just by telling people the truth. You can cause some problems by trying to help people out. Think about that situation there. But he was not intimidated by the man she was with. Go tell him, send him, tell him, tell him Jesus is the reason that you left your pot. So when you really meet that man, you will leave everything that you came with everything that he met you with. When you meet that one person and you have that encounter with Jesus Christ, all that stuff will fall off the way you thought. That, that was the symbolization to me of that pot. Because when she went down to fill that, that uh, pot up with water from the well, that will never fill her up. She'll always be thirsty. It, it is the same thing as you continue to, 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 to light up that blunt, knowing that it doesn't get you high enough. You continue to pull off your pants and get in the bed with somebody that's not your spouse. You continue to hit licks. You continue to lie on your time sheet so that you will get paid more money. You will continue to lie about who you're claiming on your taxes. You will continue to lie about your paperwork so you get more money with your food stamps and your EBT card. I'm in your house now. Don't be mad at me. All right? You don't click off. If you do, I'm going to find you. I'm going to share it on your page anyway. So, that symbolization to me meant that when you really meet Jesus, all those things that you used to need to fill you up, you won't need them no more. This woman was so excited and so ecstatic about her encounter with Christ, her encounter with that man, 
that she didn't even realize what she left behind. She didn't realize that her pot, what used to hold, what would stain her, she left it behind. And that's how you have to be. You have to leave that behind. And he wasn't worried. He wasn't intimidated by the men. When he went to the city, the men came up and, and they wanted to know, like, we need to check this, we're gonna check this dude at the gate. And I'm pretty sure the conversation went like this. Hey dog, who are you? You know, you know, Ashley? Hey, that's my that's my my little piece. That's my little and she came back and I was ready to do the dude, and she gonna tell me about some dude named Jesus. I think your name Jesus tell me something. And, I, and I'm pretty sure Jesus, you know, this ain't in the Bible. This is my interpretation of what wasn't written. Pretty sure he said, hey, hey Frank, I already know that Ashley, yeah, you've been knocking down plenty more chicks than Ashley. So if I were you, I would walk away right now. Hey, yeah, your homeboy, Toby? Yeah, yeah, he robbed the store last week. And I know this. And and yeah, yeah, uh-huh. You got some STDs. And yeah, uh, you remember that, that lie that you told on that application to get that job? Should I rest my okay, so we cool now? Alright. So I so I'm good to go. Yeah, I, I thought I thought we was good. You know, and, and if y'all got a problem, I got 12 disciples behind me that they can take care of some business. So I might look say sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? But my boys, they, they different. So if you really want these Holy Ghost, now nah, he probably ain't say all that. However, but if you walk with me, whatever he said to them, they then said, wow, that is Jesus. Whatever he said to them made them change their life around. And it was her testimony. And my last point, Start with number one. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by where he meets you. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by how you see him. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by your background. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by the man you're with now. And my last and final point, and this will be our altar call. Mama, there goes that man that's not intimidated by who he uses to uplift the kingdom. I had to I had to try to figure out, okay, so this thought, if that's what we want to call her, she was the thought, you know, you can click off if you're offended, but it's in the word, that's what she was, she, she got around. Why would we, why would anybody even care what she had to say? Why would people be saved by, you know, by her. She was a, she had five husbands. And let's not talk about all the boyfriends she had. And it wasn't even that that was a problem because she was a Samaritan and they had a different lifestyle. And, that, and that's just significant in itself. See, and then it hit me. God does not care about your background. God will use who he decides to use. And he's actually more excited to have someone that's walking the life that you walked because now his reach is so much further. You know, it was that the fact that everybody knew how bad she was. This was the town get around. And now she's running around talking about this Jesus. And to confirm it, they had spoke with the guy who also knew some things about them. So what God is saying is that I don't care about what you did. I don't care about what you used to do. I don't care about what you're struggling with. I'm going to use that to build the kingdom up. I'm going to use that one thing that you keep trying to get rid of and you keep, and the thing that you struggle with the most, I'm gonna help you one, leave it at the well, 
And two, I'm going to help you use that as your testimony. They said that it was because of her testimony that they were free. It's because of your testimony. That's why it's so huge that you share these messages and that you say what God has done for them, for you. I can tell you all day about what God has done for me, and I can tell you what it says in the Bible, but when it becomes a reality in your life, when you can go into the tattoo parlor and say, man, dog, you already know me. You know what all these tattoos mean. And you know I should be dead or in jail. But I'm alive and I am forgiven. And my sins are forgiven by the stripes on his back. I'm healed. When you had COVID-19 and you watched others pass away, but God brought you through that's how you know that it is your testimony. God is using you. When you were the most devout Muslim and you was Allah all day and you had a moment with that man, God says, I'm trying to use you right now. When, when everybody saw that video that you got exposed in and you thought it was over for you and God used it for your good, God don't care about all that. What God cares is that he gets the glory in the end. And in this moment, I want to open up the doors, <laughs> virtual doors of the church and allow us to pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for allowing us to to kind of identify the man when we see him. There's a lot of false prophets out there. And there's a lot of people that will downplay your ministry, downplay your word. They will look for a crack. They will look for a mistake and say, that mistake is why I'm not going to believe in Christ. But God, I thank you for those that, those who are true believers, that understand that the only perfect one was your son and you. And y'all are one and together. So I just thank you for the healing. I thank you for all those names on our prayer list. And I ask you to, to, to watch them. I ask you to watch over Ahmad, who says that he's struggling. He just needs to uh, get a little bit better in some areas and to stay strong. I ask you to watch over Marie and her family. I ask you to watch over Heather and the surgery that she had. God, I ask you just to touch everybody under the sound of my voice and give them a peace, a peace that they haven't felt in such a long time. God, we understand that you love us no matter what we do. You love us in spite of us. And because of that, we always give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in your mighty name. Amen. And now I want to take a time. If you're not saved, and you wanna, you wanna, you wanna meet this man, and you wanna be one with this man. I invite you to the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation because you're no longer a sinner. Just repeat these words after me: God, I have sinned and fell short of Your glory. God, I understand that you you sent your your son down to from heaven to earth and he paid the price for me he hung up on that cross for my sins and he received stripes on his back for all of the wrong that I've done and that I will continue to do because I am imperfect and God they took your son off that bloody cross and they put him in a tomb but three days later he rose again and because he rose again, I am saved. I'm saved, my sins are washed in the blood, and I accept that he is the one true living God. And he is my pathway to heaven, and my knee will bow. If you repeated those words after me, you're saved. Don't let anybody tell you different. Don't let anybody tell you 
or try to drag you back into sin. Don't let anybody try to drag you anywhere. If you repeat those words, you're saved. You may be crying. You may feel like, I don't feel no different. But there is a celebration in heaven right now because you joined the kingdom. The kingdom just expanded because of you. Hey, that's a great thing. Now, something that I haven't done in the past, but if you want to be a member of Be The Ram Global Fellowship, a ministry that's focused on winning the 97% of time that you're not in the church building, that you're not in a church setting, I want you to go to our website, www.betheram.com backslash join. And I want you to fill that out. And a member of our, our pastoral team or a ministry team will reach out to you. We'll send you a welcome package. It may have a yard sign, it may have a wristband or a shirt or something that says, be the ram. It might just be an email or a text or something. But we're going to welcome you because we want to grow the kingdom. And it doesn't matter where you are physically. Your location does not matter. We are be the ram global fellowships. I don't care if you're in Asia, China, Australia. We want you to be a part of this ministry if your heart is set on outreach, if your heart is set on winning the 97%, if you've always felt like, I want to be a part of a church, but I can't really get down with a church, this is probably the place for you. And if you want to give, if you want to donate, go to our website, betheram.com backslash giving, or you can hit our cash app, uh, dollar sign or cash tag, BTR Global, and you can donate what God puts on your heart. Yeah, we do need your funds. God will provide. All your funds go towards outreach. It goes towards all of the ministry stuff that you see. I don't receive a stipend, and I don't want one. If you want to give a love offering, make sure you say love offering. If not, it's going straight to the ministry. Hey, but you all be blessed. I hope that you have a great week, and I pray that you're better because of this message. God loves you, and so do I. Be the rain.